Okay, I'm going to get us started today. Welcome. I'm Abby Quinlan with the UWM Alumni Association. Today we're happy to have all of our wonderful panelists here and I'm going to let them introduce themselves. They're going to be talking about their experiences in the human resources industry and their careers. And to start off the event, we're going to have them do a brief introduction, then we'll jump right into our keynote speaker, Lottie Johnson. And as we go through today, feel free to put your questions in the chat, raise your hand. We do want this to be more of a relaxed networking style event. So feel free to let us know when you have questions and what those questions are. And let's get started. Hi, everybody. I'm Martha Kerrigan. I'm the uh, chairman at uh, Big Shoes Network. We're a niche job board and resource site specific to the creative side of companies like marketing, advertising, PR, web, graphic design, and social media. My work in HR is actually primarily interfacing with HR uh, hiring managers, talent acquisition, et cetera. So I'm a broad generalist and not very specifically an HR director. And I'm gonna hand it off to the next person. Hi, uh, my name is Jeff Palkowski and I'm a senior human resources specialist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So just a few miles west. Um, I've been uh, in human resources for about 17 years, and the majority of that's been in the, private, uh, the public sector. Um, actually, uh, UW-Madison is the second higher ed institution I've worked at. I also worked briefly at the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater. Um, and it may, in my current role at Madison, um, I'm primarily working workforce relations, uh, dealing a lot with um, uh, employee, employee performance, employee leaves, uh, and a whole variety of issues. Um, and I'm looking forward to, uh, to meeting many of you today. So thank you. Hi, my name is Katie Ashuda, and I am the system administrator for um, a learning management system at Children's Hospital of Wisconsin. I um, have been in human resources since 2006. So that's about 15 years or so. And I basically um, do everything learning management system related, um, education related, um, any troubleshooting, things like that. Um, I am your person. Hi everyone, I'm Lottie Johnson and I'm so excited to be here. I am a senior compliance analyst at Snowflake and that is a global uh, data platform and um, just really excited to share a little bit more about my journey and uh, hopefully meet many of you all today. So, um, so with that, I'd like to go into just a little uh, brief talk. And I want to say that when Kyle and Abby asked me to participate in the panel, I am, um, you know, I'm someone who absolutely loves my uh, UWM experience and my connection. And I said right away, yes, I will do it because I had a great experience. Um, and I really, I look for opportunities to volunteer whenever I can with UWM. So that was an honor. Uh, but when they asked me to actually talk a little bit more in a keynote speak, uh, keynote address, that was, um, that was also something that I, I could say yes to because not because of um, my UWM experience per se, but it's part of who I am in um, my life philosophy. And that's what I wanted to talk to you about is what are the, um, the, the things that drive me to do what I do. And I hope that in talking about that, that you'll also think about what is it that drives you and motivates you to, to um, pursue the different things in your life. So, uh, and before I begin that, you know, as an HR professional, one of the things that we constantly deal with are disclaimers. So uh, everything that I talk about is, you know, are, are things that I, um, are my own opinions and not reflective of UWM necessarily or um, my company. So. That's my disclaimer. I'm in HR compliance, so check the box. I feel like I have to say that. <laughs> um, so again, let's let's go ahead and get started. So uh, when I mentioned that, um, you know, uh, speaking here was something that was part of who I am. Um, what I'm referring to is my 
life philosophy. And uh, it really goes back to high school. And one of the things that I remember in high school was seeing an image of a frog. And um, this frog was leaping across the screen and it was stretched out, arms and legs fully stretched out. And sure enough, it reached its lily pad. And I will never forget that image from, from high school. Um, and fast forward through my college experience and into my professional career, one of the things that I had an opportunity to do was become a keynote speaker at a graduation ceremony. And it was a time in, in the world where there was a lot of tragedy and I couldn't figure out, you know, how could I inspire graduates and what could I say to, you know, to really um, give them hope because we had, the world had gone through the events of September 11th and it was, you know, it was a lot of tragedy happening at that time. So um, I thought back to the frog, the image of this frog leaping across the screen and really just fully determined to reach its destination. And I didn't know it at the time in high school that that image was going to be the foundation of my life philosophy. So, so when I was preparing for the, um, the graduation speech, I thought about that frog and how important it was to see that image. And every time I saw that image, I was number one, fascinated with nature that frogs always jump forward. But number two, you know, it, it was an image that made me think of how important it was to be laser focused on where you wanted to go and to have a plan to get there and give your best effort. So as I thought about the frog, I thought about the letters that made up the word and came up with this concept called frogs life philosophy. And so I'm going to talk to talk to you about it some more. Um, you know, so if we could just take a, a moment and think about a frog on the side of a little uh, on the side of a riverbank and looking across the river to see a lily pad and then jumping from where it's at, stretching out and reaching that lily pad. That's that's why I have frogs as a life philosophy. So the F in frogs stands for find your strengths and weaknesses. The R is remove your obstacles. O, organize your tasks. G, give your best effort. S, share your success. Okay, so that makes up frogs. And so I'm going to dive more into that. Um, so let's start with the F. The F to me is find your strengths and weaknesses. Um, and by that, I mean, there are a lot of self-assessment tools out there. And, you know, I, yeah, I've done many of them myself. And I think it's important to be able to recognize where your strengths and weaknesses are and um, how to fill those gaps. That's why the F is so important is because it is important to do those self-assessments. Um, and so I encourage people to do that so that you have a baseline to understand a little bit more about who you are as a person or professional. So that's why F is find your strengths and weaknesses. The R is removing your obstacles. So that means you need to, you know, think about ways to get to remove or eliminate those negative energy, negative people in your life that prevent you from flourishing. So, um, you know, it's not always easy to do, but that is really an important piece of this philosophy is because the negativity is preventing you from flourishing. Um, and as a gardener, I pull weeds all the time. I feel like the weeds are constantly there, but if you don't constantly maintain your garden and pull the weeds and negative energy out of your site, then that will eventually take over the good things and all the beautiful flowers and plants that will thrive. You, but you have to pull out those weeds and you have to remove your obstacles. The O is organize your tasks. So 
you know, that seems really simple. You need to do step one, two, three, um, but it's important to think about what those steps are and the sequence of those, those uh, steps and have a plan. Um, I think it's really important to have a written plan and be able to look at it, re you know, review it, revise it. And I've done that a lot in my career. Um, I've done that for many projects. Uh, every project has to have a plan and doesn't necessarily have to be a very detailed plan, but it has to, ha you have to have a plan. Um, very few things can be left to chance when you have something really important to deliver in, in um, the work that I do for HR compliance. But even in my personal life, if I'm thinking about pursuing um, a new career, like, like I did, I, I transitioned from 15 years in education administration to HR, and I couldn't make that transition without having a plan. And even within HR, I worked in public sector, and to transition to private sector, I had to have a plan. And to even go further from private sector to a publicly traded company, I had to have a plan. So I think that's really, that's why it's an important part of my philosophy is to organize my task. Um, and the G, the G is to give your best effort. That goes without saying, anything that you find important, you gotta give your full effort. There's, um, you know, it's really, for me, it's really important to not give half effort or see things as half empty when it means so much. Um, so it's important to give my best effort and know that even if you don't succeed, you've given that best effort. Um, so that's why it's also an important part of the philosophy is to have the G in there. And the last letter is S, which is share your success. And honestly, this is the most important and fun part of this philosophy is um, the S, share your success. And that to me means you could um, share your, uh, the success of the project, share tips and tricks that you've learned along the way from the project, or you can share your time and energy as a mentor. Um, so that's, that's why I do mentor other people is because it's something that um, is important to me to be able to um, connect with people and find ways to learn from them as well, share whatever I, I can with them to help them along their journey. And sharing your success also means being able to give back financially, if I can, to uh, causes that I believe in. So that's why it's so fun to have the S in the philosophy to tie it all together and really connect all the different efforts I've made in that project or that goal um, and be able to tie it out with sharing the success. So um, I wanted to share more about that. Um, so when I did the commencement speech, that was the message that I gave to the students was to have a philosophy, have something that you, um, you know, that you believe in and motivates you. And although I didn't know it at the time in high school, that Frog's philosophy was finding its way in everything I did personally and professionally and helped me make the transition from, you know, from um, my linguistics degree to education administration to compliance. And, um, and here I am in a publicly traded company working primarily on financial um, compliance and how it connects to the HR, um, HR duties that we have. So it's really an exciting time to, you know, to be in, to be uh, working in HR. So, and I'm sure a lot of our panelists let's also talk about that. Good and bad, it's it's quite a time to be in HR. Um, so uh, I'd like to just wrap it up to encourage you to think about what is it that motivates you to keep you going and moving forward. And as an HR professional, I constantly, um, you know, approach challenges in my work using my frog's philosophy and my frog's mindset. And I still have frog items around the house. So you can see like a frog in the background. And it's just a constant reminder that I've got to 
have a, you know, have a plan, be laser focused and give the best effort I can to reach that lily pad or accomplish that goal. And um, that's important for my work, but also around my house, we have little frog trinkets. Um, also as a reminder that we can apply a frog's philosophy in our personal lives as well. So I wanna thank you for, for allowing me to share this insight. And I look forward to hearing from our other panelists and um, getting your questions as well. So let's move into the, the um, panelist portion. And I'd like to start off with this first question. Um, you know, on the screen, I see all the panelists. So I'm just gonna go from, um, you know, just call out someone. Uh, Katie, what, is, uh, what prompted you to pursue a career in HR? Uh, and if you previously worked in a different field, what started you down that path to HR? Sure. So I actually did start out in a different field. Um, I graduated from UWM with a degree in journalism and mass communication, and my focus was advertising. And as much as I liked it, I didn't really feel that I connected with the field. And in the back of my mind, I always thought, oh, you know, I'll give this a try, but Human resources always seemed kind of interesting to me, and my mom actually worked in um, the career services um, department in the School of Business, and so um, she would talk about the recruiters that come in and interview um, the students for internships and positions, so I always thought that was an exciting, um, another exciting um, choice. So journalism didn't really work out for me. And I thought, okay, well, I'm going back to school and I'll try this HR thing. And I thought it would be a lot of fun to try recruiting since they do get to um, travel a lot of the time and just um, talk to different people. Um, however, when I got my first HR job, it was um, helping out the education department. And so that kind of led me on my path to education and human resources. And that led me to my current position. So it was kind of a roundabout way, um, probably than most people, but um, I'm glad that it did work out the way it did because I feel like I have a lot of um, good experience now um, from that journey. Awesome, thank you. How about you, Jeff? All right, let me start by saying, um, uh, Katie and I didn't collaborate here, but uh, I too am also a journalism mass comm major from UWM. Um, I thought I was going to be a reporter and actually did a little bit of that my senior year. Um, wrote for a community newspaper in, in one of the Milwaukee suburbs. And what I found was I, I thought I was writing these great stories. And then I found out there's an editor who basically takes your story and keeps like two paragraphs of the 10 that I wrote. And I found I just didn't like that. I mean, it, it, you know, I felt I was being creative. Um, so then I ended up not pursuing that field and actually spent the first 15 years uh, after graduation working in financial services and investments. Um, so uh, I won't name the company, but it's the large white building downtown, tallest building, Wisconsin. So I worked there um, and actually it was during that time that I really was exposed to human resources. Um, we had a great HR team there. They supported me as a manager. And I really found that kind of that part of my job. Um, I, I was a people manager. Um, I had a, an organization of about uh, 80 below me. So it was a lot of, lot of HR. And I found that I really liked aspects of it and decided uh, to, again, like Katie, go back to school. Um, so I went back and uh, got my master's in human resources management. Um, was cert got HR certified at the time, and uh, and again, like Katie, uh, went into recruiting, uh, local staffing in the Milwaukee area, and and I found I really enjoyed it. Uh, so I, I started off recruiting, um, and then and this question was asked earlier. Um, that was all in Milwaukee, and and I then moved out to the Madison area, and I blame my wife for that because she got a great job out in Madison. So um, here I was. I was just uh, I was in a couple of staffing jobs, moved out to Madison, and then ended up uh, working for the state of Wisconsin in, in human resources. So I worked at a couple of different agencies, uh, worked at the University of Wisconsin Whitewater, and then eventually made my way to UW Madison. And 
Uh, I've been there in um, three separate positions for about eight years now. And, um, and again, I've worked in a, a lot of different aspects of it, really, be, really been a generalist. I've tried specializing in certain areas and, and found that I really um, like to be involved in all aspects of human resources. Um, although I, I'm a specialist now as far as workforce relations, uh, I'm still, I still get to get involved in just about everything except recruiting. That's like the one area where I don't have a lot of uh, input right now, but I, uh, every other area of human resources I'm involved in. And, uh, and again, um, kind of like Lottie said earlier, it's, 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 it, I think it really matches my philosophy, which has really been, um, I guess I refer to myself as a servant leader. I've always felt like I'm here to serve others and I can't think of any better profession than human resources in that um, we are serving others. Um, I always like to joke that when my phone rings, it's not, it's not calling Jeff to say, hey, hey, I hope you're having a great day. It's, it's usually a problem on the other end. So again, we are truly helping, helping, our, helping our employers, helping our employees. And, and again, I just think it's a great, great opportunity if you want to serve. It's certainly, uh, certainly a profession that, uh, that needs that and needs people that are empathetic and, and able to, again, able to kind of do that, have that balance of being an advocate for both our, our employees and our employers. Yeah, and along the same lines, Martha, um, serving others in your in, in your um, career, how did you um, get connected to the HR field? Uh, completely accidentally. In fact, when you were talking about the frog, I was thinking of that game Frogger, you know, where you had to get the frog across the river and, and you kind of like jumped from here and then you jumped over there and, he, and that was me. I graduated with a communication degree, so not the mass comm jams side, but the uh, small group communication. My emphasis was in adult training because they really didn't have minors back then. I, I wanted to be a trainer and that's actually where I started. I started out writing training when it was really an innovative thing to have online training of all things. Um, so writing training, um, eventually uh, that training was being purchased by Manpower in a group here in Milwaukee. So switched over to writing training for all different kinds of employees that needed to be able to jump into different job tasks. Then I went into the dark side completely accidentally, didn't wanna do it, no, went into sales and marketing. And so I started to do sales and marketing training at Manpower. And that started with uh, selling the training that we had to large corporations, but then turning around and selling the temporary help services. So I had to become quickly knowledgeable in all things HR. And because at that time they were uh, selling a lot of different components to that. Um, and then uh, because of family circumstances had to stop working all together and take care of my family and my sister's family for a time and got engaged in education. And then that just, be, again, accidentally became an accident. entrepreneur. Companies would call me even while I wasn't working to say, how do I connect with this, you know, a copywriter or in uh, a creative director, that kind of thing. So just that became an email list, which became a company. So completely accidental. So we've, now we have about 4,000 clients and those clients are almost, they're evenly split between company owners and human resource professionals on all levels. Wow. That is exciting. Wow. Um, we have a lot of commonalities in some of our experiences. I think like uh, like many of you, I had a, a degree in linguistics and thought for sure I was going into education. And um, I, linguistics was fascinating to me because I could break down languages and really get to the very fundamental piece and, uh, of a language and really... Um, you know, connected to the people and how that uh, how that society impacts what you know what makes up the language. Uh, so I was for sure thinking I was going to be in education, um, and I did spend you know 15 years or so in education in administration side, and part of that was dealing with compliance with uh, state and state laws and federal laws for education licensing. So. Um, you know, I, I thought for sure I'd continue in that, uh, but an opportunity came up to go into technology and use the um, the skills I had in in interpreting interpreting laws to build software applications for a technology companies. So I, you know, I 
I took that risk and I said, okay, I have a plan. I'm going to go for it. Um, and then that led to human resources because the technology software that I was building was primarily used for human resources. So that was my end to HR. And now I work in um, a publicly traded company and deal with laws at not only the local and, and federal level, but global laws as well. So, um, you know, each of us have mentioned the different functional areas of HR that we are involved in and how we got through that journey. So I think um, it's really fascinating how our major, you know, was part of that experience, but not necessarily um, be where we ended up. And, but we still use our majors in our, um, in our career. So that's pretty exciting. Um, I'd like to go to the next question, which is, uh, you know, what, what is a, a task or accomplishment that you've had on the job that folks may not necessarily associate with human resources? Can, how about I start with Martha on this one? This is true for me, but I'm also hearing this from our HR hiring managers and influences out there, and that is presentations to different sized groups. Maybe it's a small group of five um, all the way up through the C-suite. And this is becoming more prevalent for the HR industry than ever before. Great. Katie? Um, I feel like this is kind of a silly answer, but for me, um, it was having uh, or dealing with a learning management system as a whole. Um, that's not something that I would have even realized would sit in a human resources department. Um, and I think a lot of people, based on the emails that I get and phone calls that I get, um, asking for support uh, when an online course doesn't work correctly or somebody's having trouble with sound or something, they come to me thinking that I am an IT person. And um, I, I may be a little bit more technologically um, savvy than um, a lot of the people that we work with, but I definitely have no formal training in IT. I could not um, do coding or anything. Um, I love it, but um, I'm happy that they think I'm smart <laughs> in that sense. But um, just that kind of technological um, troubleshooting um, really surprised me. <laughs> That's fascinating. Jeff, what about you? What's a task or accomplishment that you've had on the job that folks may not associate with human resources? Well, this is one, it's, it's, it's actually very, it's really, it's one that remains with me to this day because we, we wear a lot of hats in human resources and you never know what's going to get thrown at you. Um, a few summers ago, um, we had an employee, uh, a, a young, I mean, late thirties employee pass away and he was a supervisor and um, obviously his staff was just devastated and um, we reached out to employee assistance and unfortunately our, our staff was unavailable. Uh, one was one was ill and the other one was on vacation. And we had these employees that were just in need. And, uh, and, th and this was a, a second shift staff. And, you know, I, I got the news during the day. And, and I basically just brought the group together and essentially held a grief session, a, a, a grief session counseling. And like, I'm not a counselor, um, but it was just a matter of these, these employees needed someone to talk to. And so we basically just got together we talked, we talked about the, you know, the, uh, the, their supervisor and they shared a lot and, and eventually, you know, obviously directed them to more professional resources when, when, when EAO was available. But again, it was something that it, you know, it wasn't in my position description, it, but it was something that it was a need that arose. And again, I mean, and that happens a lot in human resources where it's just a lot of things fall on us. And this was one where, again, no one, it was not my job description, not someone, to, some something uh, that someone told me to do, but the need was there and I just felt it, it needed to be done. And uh, again, that one still, like I said, it's, it, 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 it haunts me because uh, it just, I just think about just all of the people that were sitting in this room. I mean, there's about 20 employees that were just, you know, dealing with this and was just doing, doing what we could together as, you know, as like a family. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that is um, a lot, you know, that happens a lot in HR is, 
We just do what we need to do to get the job done. And there is a need, there's a gap. We had to fill it, do the best that you can and get the job done. Um, it's funny that Katie mentioned she's a system admin for an LMS system because I too am a system admin for an LMS system. So that would have been uh, one of the things that I um, didn't expect to be related to HR. The other thing that, um, that I didn't expect was to see how much of HR influences the, um, you know, the auditing process for publicly traded companies. Um, you know, being um, publicly traded means that you have a, you know, shareholders that you're responsible to and just have um, do business right for, um, for your, the company, the, the public, it's really important. And that involves having the right people in the roles in your company. And that is the touch point to HR. So I would have never guessed that I would be so involved in, um, you know, financial audits as an HR professional, but it has been really eye-opening to uh, read and, you know, read deeper into uh, laws that guide companies and to um, always act ethically and responsibly. And it's been fascinating. So that is something that I would not have associated with HR early in my career. I really thought it was very narrowly hiring people and separating them. Uh, but there is just so much more to it. So I'm really happy to hear these different stories, but also like Jeff mentioned, it um, comes with some challenges as well, but we, you know, we work together and get the job done. So let me move to this next question, which is um, what do you consider the uh, emerging workplace issue that is, you know, that you're facing in, in your industry or, um, you know, just in general in HR, what do you, what do you consider it as an emerging issue right now or trend? And let me start with Jeff. Well, I, I'm guessing this should be no surprise to anyone, but um, obviously dealing with COVID, that was something that wasn't on our, on our radar. Um, so now, like many employers, we're dealing with, um, uh, we're not calling it a return to the workplace because we've all been working and most of us have been actually working harder during the pandemic. Um, we're calling it, a, in, in, uh, since I work on, in a university as well, we're calling it a reuniting of the university because many of us have been working remotely. I am working in my home now and uh, uh, and this fall we are we are committed to offer a a 2019 experience, if you will, of, of, of in-person instruction, in-person. So it's just that transition back. And, and again, and when, and when I say, and I, I don't want to use the word, which is overused, which is new normal, but it's um, because we, uh, we, I don't see it's ever really going back. We've learned a lot during this as well. I like to call it the, the biggest remote work experiment uh, of, of all time, because we <laughs> a lot of companies and uh, organizations that didn't even consider it remote work before this now see some of the benefits of it. So we're looking at, at, at hybrid opportunities where most of our staff are probably going to still maintain some component of offsite and onsite, um, but just the whole management of it, both from a, from a productivity standpoint um, to um, to, to just needs that the employees have. I mean, some of them, um, whether it's whether it's medical needs or just genuine anxieties about coming back to the workplace, um, we're, we're kind of dealing with a lot of different things. And um, so that's certainly an emerging issue, one that, um, again, we kind of saw coming. It, it, it's, I mean, it's a good thing. It's a positive that we're moving, you know, moving past this pandemic, but, but certainly something that we have to manage um, very carefully uh, in the months ahead as, as our goal is by the end of August to have the majority of our, our staff back, uh, back in person. That's a very interesting concept. I haven't heard that before. Reuniting the university, reuniting all of us together. That's very interesting. Thank you, Jeff. Katie, how about you? What do you consider as an emerging issue or trend that's, that's happening in your industry or just HR in general? Yeah, so I can think of two of them. And the first one, um, like Jeff said, is COVID. Um, and dealing with remote workers um, and versus employees that work at the hospital and who can't work um, remotely. Um, as you can probably tell, I'm working from home and um, we're not really sure what we're going to go back to. Um, Children's is still looking at all the options. I know they have um, a pilot group that's working 100% um, from home. 
Um, so they're waiting to see how that turns out. But I think right now there's a lot of issues and in, in what the senior leaders are trying to figure out is how to balance those that work from home versus those that work at the hospital um, and just the technology um, issues that go with it. Um, I've noticed a lot of, of really positive improvements um, from when they told us to all go home and take your laptops home and just stay there until we give you further direction um, versus today where everything runs smoothly. Um, my department got new computers and you know we're doing really well. So I think they're handling this um, as well as, as they can be with COVID. Um, the other thing we're seeing specifically education wise is mobile learning that's been a really hot topic for us and um, for my department. Um, we started looking at it pre COVID in like 2019 early 2020 and that kind of got pushed aside with everything that happened now we're finally going back to it so um, right now our learning management system. Um, has a mobile option, but we haven't turned it on. So right now um, we're looking at how to do that, how to uh, format our courses in order to handle our, our online courses in order to handle that. Um, and really just keeping up with that because more and more employees are asking for mobile learning um, because we have other things that are on our, um, on our phones. Like um, we have a system where you can text um, nurses and doctors, and the more they they work with that, you know, it's it's something good that they they want to continue, and they don't want to have to go to laptops and log in. They want everything on their phone, which is completely understandable. So um, it's been an interesting um, thing uh, challenge, I guess, um, looking at mobile learning and just seeing what other. Uh, hospitals are doing for their education when it comes to mobile. Thank you. Martha, what are your thoughts on this? What do you actually have four items? Okay. Yeah, four, four items. Um, one uh, that human resources moving uh, or has moved par particularly more recently um, from operational and, and response driven to strategic and marketing and proactive driven. A second piece of that is human resources has more access to the C-suite than ever before. In fact, we're now seeing titles like chief resource officer where normally that person would report to perhaps the COO, they're getting a seat at the table. And again, it's partially because of COVID, but a lot of other changes that are going on. Uh, third piece is that technology and data to support human resources has just exploded. And it's so funny, not funny maybe, but I think a lot of people go into human resources because they want to help people. They want to interface with people and they're not good at math. Well, that isn't a luxury anymore. <laughs> yeah, me too. So, um, and that includes artificial intelligence, using artificial intelligence for mapping and programming and a lot of other things when it comes to human resources. And then the, the last, the fourth one is, even with COVID, there's an incredibly low unemployment rate. Um, there are a reduced number of people entering the workforce, as well as a great number of people leaving the workforce. So we had a lot of folks that we are, are part of our connection base that are probably in their mid fifties and older. They just checked out, they're done, they're retiring now, I'm done. And yet there's a reduction of upwards of 15% coming into the workforce right now. And so with that, finding talented workers in all levels is really, really tough. And so now human resources has to be very innovative. So innovation, tech and data, access to the C-suite and more strategic as well as operational. Awesome, thank you. And I, I think the emerging issue I'm, I'm thinking about, you've all have touched on it as well, and that is, how do we integrate technology into the HR function and do it in a way that is strategic, but also um, makes sense um, operationally? So it's uh, so I, I that's what I'm seeing a lot. Um, you know, trainings are no longer as much in person as they are online, and uh, meetings are 
using all types of platforms and how you secure data when you are using all these data platforms. How do you secure the networks of all your remote workers? I mean, just how we are integrating technology into the HR space is something that I'm seeing um, as an area that I would, you know, I want to make sure I continue to stay on top of. Um, and that's something that I, I've heard all of you mention as well. So uh, actually that segues into the, the last question I have for the panel before we open it up to, um, to the audience is how do you stay on top of all these different changes in HR and, uh, you know, uh, how do you do that? What are some, some ways that you do that? And let me start with Martha on this one. I, I would begin with just some very low level, low hanging fruit. Um, for example, I read a really, I read about four or five different periodicals first thing in the morning. And one of those is the New York Times, which came out with a very interesting article that tracks how Amazon is handling human resources and what's their projection going forward with human resources. And what they do is generally true of the other three biggest employers in the country. And then it comes, you know, kind of dribbles down. Second piece is right here. Um, alumni, your, your education institution it has some great offerings and very often they're affordable and free. Um, but more formal, obviously, is you can go to the next level, which uh, UWM has a great um, ex school extension school that allows you to keep up to date with the digital trends in a certificate program. It's very low cost, very quick, and it's taught by those folks that are creating and using those programs the most often. There are also a lot of inexpensive or free programs that are available through the software providers of the technology too. So that's a good access. And then great professional association organizations. So one we tap into very often is SHRM, Society for Human Resource Management, where you can, again, get certified, grow in your skills and, and find a mentor and just, you know, like have conversations with other people and you're learning about what they're doing, which is really fun too. Awesome. So speaking of SHRM, how about you, Jeff? What are the ways that you stay on top of all the different changes happening in HR? Sure, never heard of it. Um, <laughs> no. um, I um, Well, first of all, to, to, to stay up to date, um, I do a lot of webinars. And kind of like Martha said, vendors are great. They, they I mean, if you can, you know, it, they're going to give you a lot of information. And then usually at the end is the, you know, the sales pitch. But um, you get a lot of great information. I also find a lot of employment uh, law firms also do some great uh, webinar. So I would say on a weekly basis, I'm at least I'm doing one or two webinars, um, which are good to keep up to date and also good to keep up those certification credits. Um, and obviously, SHRM, uh, yeah, I've been a SHRM member for 18 years, uh, currently serve on the state board for uh, SHRM State Council. So active as both a member as and as a volunteer leader, uh, and also at the national level as well. Um, very, very active. In fact, that's where I met Lottie about four years ago at a SHRM uh, legislative conference in DC. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of, certainly I'm um, definitely a, a, a very big advocate of, of, of SHRM and everything that they have to offer. And as far as networking, um, I spend a lot of time on social media and uh, primarily LinkedIn, but also believe it or not, Twitter. I've made some of my best connections on Twitter. There's a lot of, a lot of Twitter chats going on. Um, I'm actually involved in a global uh, crowdsourcing article that that a, um, a HR professional in the UK has put together. There's about 20 of us that are are answering some questions, and he's going to be doing an article shortly. And again, these are people from all over the world that we're just offering our opinions, kind of like we are today, answering questions, and um, and just people that I connected with over this past week that I would never would have done if uh, if um, we hadn't kind of located each other on Twitter. So. Uh, I'm actually going to drop my uh, my Twitter handle and, and LinkedIn in my chat here just because, uh, again, just a great way to keep connected. Great. Thank you, Jeff. And thanks for reminding us all to for all the panelists to make sure we do that. Um, and then if you could also, Jeff, add the SHRM uh, URL, it's Society for Human Resource Management is one of the, I think it's the world's largest HR professional organizations. So it's just one of uh, many HR groups out there, but definitely one that I've seen um, a lot of, I met a lot of folks as well. How about you, Katie? How do you stay on top of all the different uh, issues in HR? So the main way I do that is I joined a, the Association for Talent Development. That's um, like the SHRM of the training, training world. Um, <clears throat> and they offer a lot of resources. We have the Southeast Wisconsin Association for Talent Development. They're a wonderful group and they offer a lot of web, well, now it's webinars. It used to be in-person 
um, uh, uh, get togethers. Um, so I, I love just getting to know them and networking with them. That's one of my favorite ways um, to keep up with things. I also attend a lot of webinars too in my work group. I also work with four um, instructional designers that create our online courses. And we're always uh, forwarding different webinars to each other. Um, so it's really nice. And then we'll either update each other if the others can't attend, or we'll just talk about them in our meetings. Um, there are also some periodicals related to training that I subscribe to and um, I read like training magazine. Um, that's a that's a pretty good one. That's one of my favorites. And then our vendor for our learning management system has um, a group for learning management system administrators to network with each other and ask questions and help each other. And that has been so helpful to me because it's specifically for that system. So if I have a question or a problem or something, I can just um, you know send it to the group and I'll get a bunch of responses back and we all kind of help each other. Um, and it's just been great. Awesome, thank you. And like, like um, many of you, I also um, you know, join professional organizations one of the things that I do is also sign up on blogs for um, or different listservs for law firms, for employment law firms, because oftentimes they're out there at, you know, on the front lines, getting the legislation hot off the press, interpreting it. And, and they've saved me a ton of time from having to do that. And then I can go back later and look at that. So I encourage people to sign up for uh, email distribution lists for, for different law firms so that you get that information and um, you know, that saves a lot of time. Um, and then I also like Jeff, I signed up for webinars, but I don't always attend them. I sign up for them so that I can get the PowerPoint deck after the session. And that way I have a resource that I can save and do keyword lookups and whatnot. So, you know, if you look at my calendar, I will have a bunch of webinars saved on there, but I'm not attending them it's because I want to get the deck. I want to be able to digest it and process that information whenever I have downtime to, um, you know, and, and be able to reference it later. So all great, all great uh, feedback and um, from the panelists on that. So thank you so much. I'd like to now pause and see if there are any questions from the audience um, before we do a final wrap up. Are, any, are there any questions? While we're doing that, um, Abby, I want to see if there's anything that you have um, that's come in to you, and I'll put in my LinkedIn handle. I do have one. So I have a, it looks like a student who asked, as they're doing job interviews for new entry-level HR positions, do you guys have any tips for them? All right, Martha. Ask good questions. You're interviewing them as much as they are interviewing you. And absolutely prepare in advance, um, particularly if it's an online interview, because that can go awry pretty quickly. So making sure the connections and everything are working well, making sure you're dressed professionally, even if it's online, because in, in it's kind of a hypocritical world out there when it comes to interviewing in that What's okay for the interviewer may not be okay for the interviewee. So the interviewer might be wearing a wrinkled old t-shirt, but the interviewee still needs to look a little better. The interviewer might drop some F-bombs in the conversation. The interviewee, don't do that. You know, use your, put your best foot forward for that. Um, and, and then also prepare by learning about the company. One of the worst questions we get on a regular basis is, so what does Big Shoes do? So you may be applying and interviewing for an HR position, but find out what the company does and what is some of the uh, challenges that they're probably facing in general, as well as from HR. Yes, ditto that. How about Katie or Jeff, any other tips that we can offer for our interviewing students? Katie? Um, I think for myself, um, just echoing Martha, um, especially with 
getting to know the company and getting to know what the group does. Um, I've been, sat in a couple of interviews where um, they must have thought they knew what a training department does and it turned out that they maybe didn't know it as well. <laughs> so um, it, it, it's always best to err on the, on the side of, of caution. <laughs> so just know, know your stuff when you go into interviews. Jeff, I know you have a lot of tips. Let's, let's hear some of those. <laughs> well, a lot, a lot of the same, do your homework. Um, one of the one of the questions I love to ask as an interviewer is tell me something about my company that I don't know and you get some really interesting answers and also shows if they've done uh, done their homework. Um, yeah, but definitely and, and as, as, as a student it's tough because you know you, you look at all the experience and things like that. Well, I think that uh, uh, something that you really have to do is as a student you have a lot of experience and you can take a lot of the skills that you might have had whether it's at a part time job or there was through an internship whether it was just through actual schooling and and really look at what they're looking for and 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 make those connections between the skills that you have and then what they're looking for in the position and then the last thing was we talked about I can't stress the importance of networking um it, it, be on LinkedIn, even as a student, be, be on LinkedIn, link with people and, and look at the company. There might be somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. I mean, as probably all of us will say, I mean, all of us probably on this panel has probably gotten our jobs, maybe not this one or a previous one, by who we knew and not necessarily because we, we applied, went through. It, it's really, that can certainly go a long ways too, to just make connections. And that's one thing I always stress too, is try to find a connection with, with yourself and the company. And, and, and again, show that you've done, done your, your homework as, as much as hopefully they've done to, to interview you. Can I add on to what Jeff mentioned about making the connections of your past and your past experience to the job? Uh, one of the ways that I do that is to put the job description into a Word doc or you know Google doc, and then break out that description and start putting in bullets on how you know what a prior experience you might have that may relate to that experience, even if it wasn't a direct one. So, um, you know, for example, I came from public sector, and the role that I was uh, going into was compliance with financial uh, financial reporting and publicly traded companies. I didn't do that in the public sector, but what I did do was I constantly interpreted state and federal laws to find alignment and compliance with those laws for the, the, um, the district that I worked for. So that parallel connection was something that I would have to do on a different level, you know, in a different way, but in a very, similar strategy and similar approach in that I'm going to read the law, analyze it, interpret and find the connection. So when you're preparing for a job interview, take the time to copy that job description, break it out and then start putting bullet points and short statements about how your prior experience may relate to it. And that way you'll have something written down and easily uh, refer to it when you're in your interview. Um, so don't rule yourself out if you haven't had that direct experience. Find ways to connect your prior experience to the role. And if you need to, like, like we mentioned, reach out to your network. Talk to somebody who's in that industry. Talk to, um, you know, to someone who probably came from a different industry and then joined the industry. Because you'll, you'll learn some tips um, that they may be willing to share. Um, so that would, be, that, might, that would be my tip. I would right. also do some yeah. follow-up, like absolutely send a thank you note right away via email and then send a written thank you note, you know, within a few days so that it reaches them within a week or so, because you may not have landed the job through that interview, but by doing the thank you and by doing a follow-up thank you of everybody that's conducting interviews, um, so you have to get their names, obviously, is that then you become top of mind. So you may not have landed the job, but the person that did uh, land the job and accepted the position may fall through in a day or two. The person that, uh, even if you didn't land the job, I've heard so many times from clients that have gotten an alternative position in the same company that was better than the one they interviewed for because they were top of mind by sending that email follow-up, thank you. And then follow up within a few weeks to just say, hey, still interested in your company. Um, it just, 
again, for those same reasons. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions, Abby? I don't awesome. see any. Awesome. Well, I wanna just um, kind of close up the session and just highlight some things that I heard our, our panelists talk about and, um, and hopefully that will help you in thinking about what your next steps might be. So we've mentioned here today that we have different area, functional areas within HR. Um, some of us are in compliance and deal with laws at all levels, local, state, federal, global laws. Uh, some of us are in talent acquisition and recruiting and staffing. Yeah, that's you know a different functional area, but still within the umbrella of HR. And we've also had um, uh, business partners, employee relations and um, uh, learning management systems, talent, um, learning and development, those are also areas within HR. And there's, a, I think, 13 or so functional areas within HR. So you can find yourself within the HR space and working within a different functional area that may not be something that you initially thought of. So hopefully we've given you some, some um, ideas about what area you might want to pursue. Uh, I also heard that our major in college doesn't lock us into our career for you know forever. We've all explored different things and we've tapped into areas of our major and we've explored different um, you know different paths and landed in HR. So um, it's great to hear that you're not locked in that um, you know with just some probing, you can find yourself in an HR space without even realizing it. So um, that's pretty cool to, to hear how our majors played a part in that, that HR journey. And then the last big thing I heard was networking is absolutely key and really essential to uh, develop yourself professionally, but also to, um, to do that personally too. And networking may include become signing up for a mentor program or becoming a mentor to someone else to share your your knowledge and share your ideas having somebody to connect with so we hope that you will take that next step and reach out to us on linkedin or follow us on social media because we've all kind of you know um, volunteered for this opportunity because we want to support um, the, the um, those of you who are thinking about going into HR, we want to really help you expand your network. Hopefully we've given you some ideas on how we did that for our careers and um, networking is something that I heard repeated within our conversations today. So uh, are there any other takeaways that our panelists wanna highlight? Okay. All right. Well, I wanna just close up to say that uh, we really appreciate you joining us today. Um, following this session, there will be a follow-up email from the Alumni Association with um, our contact information in there as well and some additional materials. So we really hope you found this session worthwhile. And I'm going to go back and turn it over to um, Kyle and Abby for any closing comments. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Lottie, for leading today and all of the panelists' great discussions. Like Lottie said, we will be sending a follow-up email and there will be a recording that you guys can all access if you wanna go back and get some of those tips. Uh, and that's it for today. So thank you all and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Take care, everyone.